devastation. In this one moment, it's just almost incomprehensible that they can exist right now. So, and we are grateful. So close. Trigger warning: This podcast is intended for men, not boys, not babies, men. This is how we disable toxic masculinity. We need to kill all men. This pagan patriarchalism that is coming back out of the shadows. Feminists hate patriarchy. It's the woman that runs the show and the woman that runs the community and is the backbone of, of that area. I'm a nasty woman. A loud, vulgar, proud woman. Patriarchy. patriarchy. You are male privilege. Are you saying you have authority over me? Go eat your superior! I personally can't see why egalitarianism would be a bad thing. The assumption that wives should make babies instead of money is part of the patriarchy. Don't f***ing say hi to strange women you don't know. Patriarchy. The patriarchy. 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 Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And that is Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 to 12. You are on the Fight, Laugh, Feast network, and you are listening to the Patriarchy. My name is Tony Dapani, and I am joined by my co-host, Pastor Joseph Randall Spurgeon. Woman, get back in here and make me a sandwich. Joseph, what kind of sandwich are you eating today? Yeah, I have, um, so to start this new year right, got some roast beef, piled way high, man, like super high roast beef, some um, horseradish sauce, kind of gives it this spice, Um, a bun, sesame seed bun, and all of it is uh, lovely prepared for by Arby's. What? What? What happened to your wife? Um, she's she's been taking care of the kids. Okay. Okay. So I decided to get some Arby's. I thought it would be good. Nice. I actually like Arby's. Arby's is good. Now I did want to start things off by you know I've been pretty critical of your sandwich choices in the past. <laughs> and I've probably sinned a lot, and so I want to um, apologize to you about your sandwich choices. Okay, I feel like there's 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 more to this. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just wanting to apologize, and I hope you're not recording this at all. I'm just trying to apologize to you, and you're not recording this, are you? <laughs> this won't be revealed to the public. No, not at all. Kind of... I mean, that's no. I mean, it's it's not a podcast. Uh, we're not recording. We're not okay. Not not at all. No. No. Okay. All right. Well, what did you have? <laughs> uh, that's a deep cut. Um, I had a smoked turkey sandwich. It's actually a panini, and a panini. Uh, it's a panini. That sounds we, like a. That sounds kind of pansy. It does, but it's awesome. It it, so. it, t- it tastes great, and we actually have the the like panini grill. You know, it's it looks like a it looks like a waffle iron. You know. But um, but it's it's for making panini sandwiches, yeah. and it's great. P- panini is just a word that just doesn't. Yeah, sound. It's, it really needs a different. <laughs> it, it should just be a grilled sandwich. You know, that's just, we should call it gr- grilled sandwich maker. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, smoked turkey, uh, Swiss cheese, uh, lettuce, tomato, um, always zesty mayo on there, um, and uh, it's it's good. My my wife makes perfect paninis. Like it, my kids love them. Um, little little. Not fun to clean up, I think, because sometimes the stuff kind of, if you got a lot of cheese like you should, it kind of oozes out the side a little bit and kind of gets stuck on the uh, on the grill. But, man, mm, good stuff. I actually want one right now. That would be good. I thought you had one right now. No, I ate that earlier. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to be highly critical of your sandwich. Just don't release my apology on, on, on the air, okay? <laughs> okay, I, I, won't. I won't. I won't do that. All right. <laughs> Uh, I feel like only half of our listeners are going to even understand what we're joking about. <laughs> well, 
Because if you release it, you're persecuting me. And uh, of course, I, um, yeah, of course, that that's what it is. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's real right. persecution. Yeah, it is. No, seriously. Uh, um, if you don't know what we're joking about there, then you're probably probably better off. But uh, <laughs> that's for sure. In all serious, <laughs> yeah, a lot, lot less stress in your life. <laughs> in all seriousness, um, you know, we usually have a, a, a funny segment here and something about feminism ruining the world. And it is. It's still ruining the world, even though we're not going to cover it today. But uh, we do want to move to something more serious. We have a, a, an important interview that we're going to have in a little bit. And um, so the conversation we're about to have is, uh, I think, I think something we that uh, we don't like to think about, don't like to talk about, but uh, it's true. And uh, it's going, of course, to the, the context of the verses that we share at the beginning. And so we do have a clip to play, and we don't really have a, a, a funny name for this segment other than this is just a true story that we want to play. Breaking news to report to you right now, as Pastor Wang Yi of the Early Rain Covenant Church of China has been sentenced to nine years in prison in a Chinese court. Now, this was held in secret. Nobody knew that this was going to be taking place today as far as his sentencing goes. And uh, they have come up with the crime of illegal business practices for the fact that Pastor Yi was printing Christian material for books. Now, of course, this story goes all the way back to December of 2018, where Pastor Yi, along with about 150 other members of his very large unregistered church, were taken into custody by Chinese officials. Many of them, you know, held on various charges. Uh, you know, some serving some prison time, others have been released, including Pastor Yi's wife, who was released on bail back in June. However, she is serving on house arrest right now uh, in an apartment in uh, the Shindu province with the couple's 12-year-old son. Uh, however, it does not look like Pastor Yi is going to be joining her anytime soon. As I said, China sentencing Pastor Yi to nine years in prison. Absolutely heartbreaking. This shows you the communist regime of China and you know the religious persecution against Christians in that country is just sickening to see what is taking place there. This man who is an innocent man, who was a pastor of a church, is not even allowed to practice his faith. And now he's going to be separated from his wife and child for nearly the next decade. So here we have uh, this new story, and uh, many people have probably followed this on Facebook. It's been happening for a while. There's that early rain church in China. This pastor, uh, Wang Yi, and his church uh, were raided and arrested. And then here we've we've heard that he is now facing 10 years, been, or been sent to 10 years of, of prison for preaching the truth, preaching the gospel. And, um, you know, this should move us, obviously, to prayer, concern. This is disheartening for Christians. Yet at the same time, we are reminded of the words of Christ Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those uh, uh, who are hated for my sake. When people uh, insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. And and the response to persecution is to be rejoicing. Now, Pastor uh, Wang Yi wrote a a letter a while back, uh, actually right around the time he was arrested originally or right before that. And uh, the letter, very encouraging in in that he... he, uh, it's called my statement, the disobedience of faith. And I, I just that word, the disobedience of faith. Mm-hmm. It's a twisting, you know, of the obedience of faith and, and what he means by the disobedience of faith. So obedience of faith is we're obedient to God. We're obedient to Christ. We're obedient to his commandments. Disobedience of faith here means his disobedience in faith in Christ to the commands of a government that tells him you cannot speak of Christ or a government that says you must register to speak of Christ. And uh, so he's disobeying. So I want to read this. It says, According to the teachings of the Bible and the mission of the gospel, I respect the founding powers of God in China, because the king of waste and the king of kings are all in God. 
To this end, I obey God's arrangement of Chinese history and institutions. Interesting there, he calls the, the people on earth the king of waste. <laughs> <laughs> Man, right out the gate with some hard words, truthful words that he's going to respect the founding powers, the authorities that God has placed. And to that end, he's going to obey God's, uh, the, the civil magistrates as they've been instituted. Then he says, as a pastor of the Christian church, I start from the Bible and have my own understanding and views on social, political, and legal fields. What is justice and the governance of goodness? At the same time, I'm full of disgust and hatred for the CCP's persecution of the church, the deprivation of human faith, and the freedom of conscience. However, the change of all social and political systems is not the mission of my calling, nor the purpose of the gospel being given to the people of God. What he's saying is he's not a revolutionary. He's not coming specifically to overthrow system the, the, the political system. Now, he makes very clear in here in this letter, which we, we ought to recognize, is that the gospel does confront the political systems. But it's not his primary purpose to overthrow um, the civil magistrates. Right. Reminds me of Matt's book, uh, Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, where I think it's the very last chapter in there where it talks about that very subject that the doctrine itself even is not meant for you know violent overthrowing it's meant to actually prevent it absolutely now he goes on to 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 write that uh his faith is in Christ his faith is in the teaching of Christ and it's it's the cross of Jesus Christ that's the only salvation he says that every chinese must have it's it's the true hope uh for all peoples and so uh, that is where you need to turn to. And he's not going to stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, I also believe that the persecution of the church by the Chinese communist regime is an extremely evil crime. As a pastor of the Christian church, I must sternly and openly blame such sins. The calling also requires me to violate all human laws that violate the Bible and God in a nonviolent form in peace and patience. Christ, my Savior, also asked me joyfully, bear all the costs of transgressing evil laws. But this does not mean that my personal and church disobedience is a political act in any sense of activism or civil disobedience, because I have no intention of changing any of China's systems and laws. As a pastor, the only thing I care about is the disobedience of faith, the shock of sinful humanity, and the testimony of the cross of Christ. As a pastor, my disobedience is a part of the gospel mission. The great mission of Christ requires our great resistance to the world. He goes on to say, The disobedience of faith, the patience of the body, are the ways we witness another eternal world and another glory king. Uh, I would encourage anybody to go look at this letter that he has written. It's, it's too long for me to be able to read all of it here. But the point he gets to is that even if he's persecuted, he's hated, he is going to stand strong on Christ. He's going to keep preaching, and he's going to pray for those who are persecuting him. He says he he has sympathy for those who are persecuting him because he knows that when he dies, he's going to be with the Lord, and those who are persecuting him, if they do not repent, are going to face the justice of God. And so he prays for them that they would repent. His story has been really encouraging, I mean, in some ways. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's sad because of what he's going through, but I mean, the, the way that he endures it, um, what he's written, the letters, even what his... Uh, there's a letter, I think, actually, that his uh, church wrote uh, about him. Um, I think that, if I'm correct, I believe they just wrote it, and I think they sent it to the government, and they said, like, he is our pastor, and he's a faithful pastor. I mean, the way that his church supports him and loves him, it's... It's really encouraging. I mean, it it just is to, to watch that um, play out. You know, in juxtaposition to <laughs> what what I'm not, I'm not going to say that there aren't Christians being persecuted in the United States, but obviously not to that degree. Um, but what I mean, I was going to say in juxtaposition to what American Christians think is persecution, it wasn't that many Christmases ago when what is it like a couple years when it was the big uproar over Starbucks you know, I don't know, having red cups on Christmas and taking something off there and everybody was up in arms and acting like this was an attack on Christianity and, you know, that was like the big thing. 
Yeah, yeah. So there is there is a juxtaposition in one sense of someone physically taking persecution, being beat, and those things, and the things that we might be tempted to to whine about and complain about here. Um, but I would say that this should encourage us, and we should be reminded of Christ's words, because persecution doesn't always look like being jailed. It doesn't always look like, you know, we hear often of, of Muslims cutting the throats of Christians, and um, that certainly mm-hmm. is persecution. But the words there in the Beatitudes are, blessed are you when people insult mm-hmm. you yeah, and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. And, and the thing we have to learn where we're at is that we, we, we're going to face different levels of persecution for standing up for the faith. Now, it ought to be for the faith, right? The Bible reminds us that we're, we're not to be persecuted for mm-hmm. doing evil. I mean, if we're being punished for doing evil, if we're one of those, if we're somebody that kind of goes out places and we're just brash and harsh and, 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 treat people like garbage and then they respond to us wickedly we don't get to then turn around and be like oh i'm i'm the victim here i'm the victim you know you don't get to then pretend like you are being persecuted for christ this says blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me now that of me is the important Mm -hmm. part there (laughs) Right. We, we, we want to be on guard against some kind of martyr complex. You know, we we're we're harsh to people. We uh, we know how to trigger people and then they get triggered and then we can claim persecution. On the other hand, we do want to be bold and speak the truth. And uh, and then we're going to be pers- persecuted for that. You're going to be hated for that. Speaking the truth to a place that that. To people that love lies is considered hate. Um, there's this uh, in our in our Presbytery. I maybe even talked about this before on on our show. I can't remember. There's this quote that we have where it's like the one eyed man is king in yeah. the land of the blind. <laughs> yeah, you said that before. That's a great quote. <laughs> and then the but the rest of it is really the one eyed man is a monster in the land mm-hmm. of the blind. Mm-hmm. And so where we live. <laughs> We live in the land of the yes, blind. We do. And if you can see just a little bit, just enough to point some things out, that, that thing over there doesn't look right. That thing over there, uh, you're about to run off a cliff. Looks like that 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 road, it's a dead end. Uh, being able to see those things and point those out, it's going to be enough to be hated. And our response then, uh, the response is not to be, oh, oh, look at me. I'm, look how great I am. Response not to be puffed up with pride or to be beat down and to be discouraged. You know, um, we believe firmly that Jesus Christ is victorious, that the church uh, cannot be defeated, that uh, the gates of hell will not prevail. And persecution is not evidence contrary to those truths in Scripture. In fact, persecution is evidence to those truths, because it's by persecution that the church grows. And so our response needs to be rejoice and be glad. When we're hated, we rejoice and be glad. Not because we're hated, not because that makes us seem like we're greater Christians than others, but we can rejoice and be glad because our reward in heaven is great. Well, in the, in the early church, it wasn't how many, it only took what? It was a couple hundred years for the um, after they started getting persecuted. It went from like what, like five thousand to like six million in a couple hundred years, I think. And then it got to a point where it was so big that uh, Christianity was not outlawed anymore in the Roman Empire because I think it was over fifty percent of the populace was Christian at that point. Yeah, I'm not Zach sure on those numbers, but I, you're 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 right in the the direction, which is that persecution didn't actually put an end to the church. Uh, there's, I can't remember who said it is that the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Tur- the, Tertullian. of the church or the fertilizer mm-hmm. of the church. Yeah. And when you think of how the church was persecuted, I mean, intensely. So think of, uh, if, 
if you go back and you think of like 65 AD, the temple's still standing. The Jews have turned their back on Christ. They've rejected the Messiah, most of them, many of them. And around 65 AD, Rome starts to join in the persecution. And Nero comes in and he's persecuting. And Paul and Peter are both killed. Leaders of the church are being killed. And you would think, man, this is a point in which it looks like this is over. But no, for one, God comes in and destroys Jerusalem. The Romans end up attacking the Jews, and the persecutors attack the other persecutors. And and yet Christians are preserved, and they continue to grow. They continue to preach the gospel, continue to preach the truth. And it does get to a point in which when Constantine comes along, and everybody wants to look at Constantine, many people do, as like, he's the part where the Christianity was ruined. But really, no, he's the part when... When Christianity has grown and God, by his His grace and mercy, allows the emperor to come in and put an end to persecution and, and to make Christianity uh, have a place where it can flourish. And it does, flourishes well. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's abuses and things that happen along the way throughout church history that have to be reformed. But uh, uh, the, the truth of the gospel is that persecution... Um, results in growth and that ought to give us hope that we can we can rejoice and be glad today when we share the gospel when you share the gospel with your neighbor and your friend and you're hated you can rejoice and be glad uh, because your reward in heaven is great and you can rejoice and be glad because God is going to use what your persecution he's going to use your suffering for a greater purpose and that, that's that's what always happened none of our suffering is ever pointless no matter even if we can't see the answers none of our suffering is pointless we're going to take a break when we come back we're going to be on the line with daniel kearney a man who is all too well acquainted with persecution so stick around you're on the fight laugh feast network and you are listening to the patriarchy we'll be right back Does Nepal have a king? Does Nepal have a king? There is a king. God is king. Sometimes it seems as if there's no security. Right, right, brother, just transit for me. If you can transit for me. It seems like there's no security. There's no stable government. But God's kingdom has justice. We're on the line with Daniel Kearney. Daniel's originally from New York, but he's from Frontline Community Church in Dallas, Georgia, and has been living in Asia for 10 years, currently lives in Nepal, is married to his wife of 10 years, and together they have six children, one of which is due in June. Daniel, welcome to the Patriarchy. Thank you, thank you. So Daniel, you have six kids now, um, and all of them are baptized? Uh, well, no, sir. Uh, cl- uh, the first, the newest one is still unborn, but we know life begins at conception. So um, I've heard of Pado Baptist. I've never heard of pre uh, pre birth <laughs> Baptist. <though. laughs> yeah, yeah, you got me there. All right. <laughs> it is a blessing to have you on on our show. Um, I have been following your your some of your videos that you've been put out and our church prays for you often um can you just kind of share with us how you got involved in in your because you're from you're from the united states but you've been living in 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 asia for 10 years how did you how did you get involved in ministry in in asia what what led you over there Right. Well, the Lord <clears throat> saved me by his grace as a 12 year old boy. I uh, was largely raised in a Christian home. Uh, my mother raised me alone. My father was not there, but my mother took me in and out of uh, too many churches as a boy. And, and um, I 
was saved in a, a Baptist church as a 12-year-old boy. I ended up going to Bible college. And when I was in Bible college, a missionary came through with a presentation. Ba- back when slide presentations were a thing, uh, <laughs> yeah. back in the like, mid-90s. And, um, and he had shown these, yeah, these, these dramatic pictures of India and the, and the poverty, suffering, and the, the chaos. And then it just moved my heart. And uh, specifically for that region, I, I, I always wanted to, to be in some type of full-time ministry and serving the Lord. And uh, I, 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 yeah, I was just impressed so much by, by uh, what I saw in India. And after um, after Bible college and after a, a, a time in the in the military, in the army, I I, I, I got a one way ticket to to India, and um, and that was why 2009 is when I arrived in India in August. So, uh, with with the intent of plan, church plan and preaching and evangelism. So, oh wow! So you you got a one way ticket and you get there. What what do you start doing uh, when you get there on the ground? Did you have a church that you were already partnering with over there, or were you kind of on your own? How how did that work? That's right. I immediately uh, was attached with a local church there called uh, Jerusalem Prayer House. It was in a very uh, remote, small uh, village. And um, so I, I began learning the language there and, and preaching um, and um, we would preach at five every every morning at five o'clock in the morning. It's just the way the Indian life is Indian life. They're just very ascetic, even in their expression of Christianity. So, and yeah, just jumped right in there, learned the language and preaching. That's right. When did you start doing like? So you said preaching at five a.m. Was that in the open air, or was that in like a church building, or the? Uh, when did you? Because the videos I've seen have all been mostly. You, you in the open air or in, in villages and those kinds of things. So when, when did that come about? Right, right. Um, the first part of your question. So this was, uh, I would preach at 5 o'clock in the morning in a church building, but it, it it's kind of a hybrid between street preaching and church preaching because it was um, intended to be played over the speakers so that the whole village would hear uh, the sound of the word of God in the morning. And in Indian culture and life, uh, people are very um, uh, keen on on. on on hearing early morning prayers and, and the Hindus and the Muslims and the Christians all have like this competition for the airwaves in the early morning. The Hindus will be chanting uh, on their loudspeakers from their temple. The Muslims will have the, 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 all, uh, the Shahada blasting. And then the Christians will be up there at five o'clock. In the <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's how it all started off. And then I didn't get into open air preaching in, until a couple of years after when I learned the language. So, okay. So let's get right into so what what kind of reception do you did you receive being a missionary there, and have you received doing preaching and and sharing your faith? Well, I, I have to say I was shocked at the eager reception and the attentiveness that people would would give to the open preaching of the word of God. When I got involved in open air preaching and, and I felt competent enough in the local tongue enough to, to get out there with the open air. And when I was able to convince my Indian brothers to, to not be ashamed, they all, they all were telling me this is suicide. You can't do this. This is too dangerous. And I had to give them constant sermons and pep talks about uh, you know, the example of the apostles and, 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 and men who have gone before. And, and finally, when I can get everyone on the streets, um, people would stop and listen and crowds would like instantly form and, and it was amazing. I mean, people would come falling on their knees with tears flowing down their faces, calling on the name of the Lord. It was remarkable. But there was always there, there was always a one element in, in this experience that there were some extremely violent uh, uh, Hindus who were members of, of local um, uh, Hindu, Hindu radical groups. And so we didn't get a whole lot of opposition. But when we did get opposition – it was intense and life-threatening. It's not like in the U.S. when you open air preach and, yeah, people will maybe cuss you, maybe you get spit at, and you have, like, this constant uh, resistance. In India, you didn't have any resistance, but as soon as it came, it was – you were beaten with clubs, and you had a rope tied around your neck, and you were dragged through the street, and you thought that was it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which happened to us, yeah. So uh, we're, we're not used to that kind of <laughs> – Nope. <laughs> of, of, of response here. And so how, what was your, so the first time that something like that happens, what, what is your thoughts? What are you doing? 
How are you responding to that? Oh wow! Um, it, immediately, I, I the very the, like the first time this happened, I, I can't deny there was panic. There was a sense of uh, of wow, I'm out here in a strange country, um, surrounded by local people without another American with me or anything, and and this seems like it may be my last moments. And 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 usually there's panic, but that that seems that you always yielded to a sense of tranquility. And calm. And on one occasion, um, after having been uh, dragged off a mountain, we were preaching from on top of, and I had a rope put around my neck and, and dragged through the village. And uh, after you know, they beat me over the head with a with a, a wooden stick, uh, repeatedly punched me in the face, and they're tightening this rope, dragging me through the street. Uh, we had tried to escape, but they blocked all of the the roads on the in the village with, with tractors. They had obstructed any possible escape route. Um, I, I, the verse just came to me, uh, into your hands I commit my spirit. And and, and that verse just gave me great calm and and, and resolve um, to, to trust the Lord. And um, so, yeah, at first it's, it's terrifying, but the Lord gives grace, so. This is, how, how often does this type of response happen to you? Is this like an all, this is like kind of a rare, or is this all the time? Well, from the years 2000, to answer your question, uh, from the years 2014 until 2017, which was the year I was deported from India. So 2014 was when I began to, it was 2012, 2012, when really began to involve, get involved in open air preaching until 2017. Um, basically, every six months, we would have a violent uh, encounter. And we we would go out street preaching six six days a week in 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 India, and at some point within a six month time frame, we would have a an angry lynch mob out that would come with you know clubs. Like I said, six, this would happen like every every six months. So, yeah. So what what motivates you to continue in spite of in spite of all of this? Like, what motivates you to just keep going? Well, that's a good question. I it's. It's it's the reality that that the grace of God in Christ has saved us. We who believe uh, He's washed us from our sins in His own blood, and that He has secured us an eternal redemption, and He has saved us from from his, from the wrath of of the Father, which we rightly deserve. And to know that this life saving narrative, this message, is a difference between heaven and hell for for all of these souls, and. And that many out in this part of the world have never once heard the only name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. And knowing that we have that name, and, and it's just simply a matter of getting this great word out, this good word out. And if they kill us, well, okay, this body dies, but our spirit goes to heaven. But if, if they die without Christ and without the gospel, then they sink into the bottomless pit for an eternity. I, 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 it's, there's, a, there's an asymmetry there. That it causes us to, to to not be intimidated and and to keep going. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, Daniel, let, let me uh, ask you this then. So, in our context, uh, we we don't quite face that same kind of physical threat, but uh, there's still a great fear among us just to share the gospel with our neighbors and and um, or to stand firm. You know, right now. In, in our in our country, the big issue is is are you going to stand firm on sexuality on on what the Bible says about uh, homosexuality, and it's the pressure is to conform to the culture. What what in, in the, the kind of the experiences that you have had would you say to encourage uh, us who are here, different culture, different environment, to still be able to stand strong, and you know. Um, when it doesn't necessarily look like having a rope thrown around your neck, but it looks like your friends and everybody else disowning you. What what do you, what kind of wisdom do you share with us from that? Right. Well, uh, y'all live in the United States of America, which in my opinion is the greatest nation on earth. And there are freedoms enshrined in our constitution have been bought with the blood of patriots that afford us freedom of religious expression and freedom of speech in our first, uh, the first amendment of our constitution. And if many you know, right-wing conservative, you know, red Christians 
were as eager, for instance, to uh, defend the First Amendment and its rights as they were the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms, I, I think that America would be great again. I, I think that if we recognized and used the liberties that are, are freely granted us, um, then, then, the, the, then America would, 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 would be revived. And um, out here and where I live, I cannot preach the gospel without the threat of, of imprisonment or deportation. And no local Christian can't without threat of, 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 deport, of, of being in prison for five years. So there's always a, a calculated risk that we have to assess before we engage in any, in any form of events, even handing out a track or handing out a New Testament. And, and, and I, I think about my American brothers who are still there and, and how y- y'all have freedom. I mean, you can just go and you can just distribute Bibles and distribute tracts and you can go outside your local abortion murder mill and, and, and cry for the unborn and preach the gospel to those going in and preach the gospel on the street corners outside uh, sports games and what have you. And, and I think about how many, quote unquote, evangelical conservative Christians are so, again, eager to defend that. The, const- the Second uh, Amendment, but the First Amendment, uh, the freedom of, of, of speech and religious expression, is seems to be thrown by the wayside, and and slowly these liberties are being eroded and being taken away, and and there's no greater use for freedom of speech than than, than the preaching of the gospel, and um, I, I would encourage my American friends to to be bold for Christ, to to speak freely, um, because you don't have to fear government oppression or tyranny. Uh, it, it's it's you have liberty, you have liberty, and it's it's a rare commodity that most countries on earth don't have the freedom to speak freely and, and to and to preach Christ openly without fear of, of gov- repercussions from the government. So, you were talking about uh, passing out gospels and New Testaments and Bibles. Um, what is that like trying to get those into the places where you're um, where you're ministering at and if you can't say, that's fine. Um, uh, but I just wondered if, if that's something you can talk about, uh, how that's even, is that even possible? How's that's done? Right. Well, hey, contrary to popular, to, 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 uh, uh, popular thought, I actually, I don't, didn't have to smuggle any of these things. Um, th- there's a Gideon publisher here. So we, uh, we get these new Testaments for free. Like we currently wow. have several hundred new Testaments, right. Um, uh, in our home, but we, we go out and we distribute these New Testaments. Now, getting them out is, is the more risky part. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, we didn't have to smuggle them, actually. There's, there's printers in-house in the country here still, so. One of the things, to kind of summarize what you were saying earlier, was it, it's, we have that freedom, and so we ought to not take it for granted. If, if I'm reading you right, we ought to be using what God has given us now to proclaim the gospel, to preach the gospel, and that's a very encouraging thing to hear and a convicting thing to know that we don't often do that. Um, let me ask you this. So what what are some of the, other than the facing of persecution, Daniel, what are some of the things that Christians here can also be praying for Christians in, in Asia, Nepal, where you're at? What are like some of the Maybe with some of the theological battles, some of the the, the things that are facing Christians uh, where you're at that uh, we may not be familiar with. Well, interestingly, in the Indian context, it was remarkable that people who called themselves Protestants would have images of Christ and and, and pictures and statues and, and would incorporate the these icons into their worship. And so there's not even often a basic understanding of, of the difference uh, from your left hand and your right hand, theologically speaking, a uh, basic concepts of the Trinity and, and, and just theology 101 is, is, is uh, grossly lacking, especially in more rural contexts. So where there, I know in the West where there's debates among like Reformed Baptists about you know, divine impassibility, does the Father have emotion or not? Over here, it's, it's uh, you know, sh- should we worship a statue or not? It's, well, there's the a level of theological uh, sophistication and refinement is not there. It's still in a very, very nascent stage uh, uh, theology here. And um, the whole debates regarding God's sovereignty and salvation, which I believe are crucial to understanding God and, and interpreting the scriptures rightly. Uh, th- there's people here that don't even 
have any familiarity with, with the, the differing viewpoints. They're not even accustomed to the, 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 the profundities of God's sovereignty. And so uh, I would suggest that the, the, the big theological issues out in this context are, in a sense, the lack of theological issues. There's just a lack of, of, of depth in many cases. There's uh, even I've met, I've met, for instance, pastors who can't read or they're illiterate. Um, one pastor I met, I, he, he's, he cannot read anything. And I said, well, how do you prepare your sermons? He said, well, the Holy Spirit teaches me. And, and, <laughs> and this is too wow. much. Yeah. So there's a great need for teaching and, and, and for leadership training. And, and um, I believe this is the highest calling, the highest function of a missionary would be to, to mobilize, equip local leaders with proper uh, uh, doctrine and, and teaching hermeneutics. Uh, that's a great need, yeah. Do you see any of that influence? You were talking about somebody saying the Holy Spirit leads me when they're not actually reading Scripture. Do you see any of that influence is coming from uh, the West, or, or is that something that was kind of already there? Um, that has largely been a result of of, of Western influence, um, of, of charismatic theology, of Pentecostalism. And uh, exactly when I would talk to the uh, locals, they would default to, I'm a Pentecostal. If you ask them what their doctrines, what their beliefs is, that was like the default state. Unless you had some type of theological education, you were by default a, a Pente- uh, charismatic or Pentecostal. <laughs> so, and this was, yeah, came heavily influenced by Benny Hinn and, and these, uh, these false preachers and prosperity preachers who have come and, and put their, their, their teeth into the Indian context. So I, I asked that because, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the documentary uh, American Gospel, um, but they, uh, in it, they actually talk about the, the, the American Gospel that we're exporting to the other nations is exactly what we were just talking about, which is the Gospel of Prosperity, um, the Gospel of Works. Um, and I was just wondering if that, had, if that had touched the countries that you were in as well. It seems like it has. Yeah, I, I can remember, and speaking, it's not just uh, just that. America, we, we, we pass on so much. I can remember uh, standing in um, on an island in the Philippines in, in their mall, and um, uh, I'm the only white guy visible that I can see. It's all brown hair and brown 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 people, Filipino people all around. And yet, I'm looking up while I'm standing in the middle of this mall at at uh, big posters of. Americans immodestly dressed selling clothing and you got like music about kissing a girl, kissing a girl playing over the, the, the speakers and you're, and, and it just hit me, mm. it, which goes back to what you've said about our freedoms that we have and yet how much I think we're going to have to answer for, for uh, as a nation. Cause I mean, this place in the middle of Asia with the Philippines was, just being inundated with feminism and sexual immorality and all coming from, from our country. Well, Daniel, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I know that it's, I think quite early in the morning where you are right now. Um, as we wrap up this interview, uh, if we can ask for everybody listening to, how can we pray for you and your family and for the work uh, that you're doing over there? Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, pray for the, our, the maintenance of the orphanage. Um, we have one girl who has been afflicted, it seems, um, by an evil spirit or by a uh, psychological disorder. Um, and uh, this hap- has been in the recent in the past two weeks. But after we had prayer for her and, and she has seemed to um, recover from that. But um, another orphanage nearby, a friend of mine's, another American, was raided and shut down by the government. Um to so just pray for wisdom and, and discretion and in that regard that we don't have, we don't get on the government's radar in a bad way and that we are able to, to, to preach Christ and him crucified boldly. And yet uh, in a way that again, doesn't attract a government and, um, and please pray for my wife just recovered from is recovering from surgery. Um, she had an, uh, an ovarian dermoid cyst removed uh, during her expectancy. And, and praise God, the surgery was a success. And the baby is, is fine. And she's fine, even though they had to, again, remove from her ovary. And that was remarkable. And uh, just please pray for a safe delivery for the child and, and for a healthy uh, mother. Thank you for your, your prayers in that way. Thank you so much, Daniel, for coming on. I, we, 
we really appreciate it. We appreciate the time that you're taking out of uh, out of your day, early in your day, and uh, away from your family. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, gentlemen. God bless you. That was Daniel Kearney. You're listening to The Patriarchy on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. We'll be right back. Inkább nem is mondok semmit, de például a született németek is a legtöbb német nagyvárosban visszaszorulóban vannak. A bevándorlók ugyanis először mindig a nagyvárosokat foglalják el. So what you're hearing, we haven't all suddenly started speaking in tongues. You're hearing from Hungarian. <laughs> And this is from Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. And uh, this is actually what he was saying. He said, I'm convinced that in order to save Europe, Those who can provide us with the biggest help are those whom we are helping right now. We're sowing a seed, giving the persecuted what they need and getting back from them the Christian faith, love, and perseverance. And he goes on to state in this State of the Union speech that it's, it is Christianity that is the solution to world's problems and that Hungary needs to reclaim its Christian heritage And in doing so, they're going to protect Christians from being persecuted. And he's speaking up to uh, um, put an end to persecution. He says the only solution for Europe is to discover its Christian roots and reaffirm its Christian heritage. You know, we've been talking about all this uh, persecution, and it can be tempting. It can be tempting to be discouraged and think, "Man, uh, we're you know we're going to everything's going to hell in a handbasket." Can we just get the, the helicopter ride out of here? And uh, what I wanted to show you, what we wanted to show you with, is that uh, there are people, there are politicians, believe it or not, that are that are woke, <laughs> that are yeah. that are awake, and there will be, there will be. The Bible's very clear. Daniel chapter seven, very clear, says, "I kept looking in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven." One like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Brothers and sisters, as we think about being persecuted, we need to have our eyes on the prize, faith in that king, faith in his promises. And there are many promises, promises that the church will be victorious, promises of, of eternal life, promises that he has crushed the serpent. Uh, the book of Revelation uh, chapter 12, if you got time, go read that. Great picture of this war that goes on between the dragon and And the woman, woman representing the church, the woman gives birth to a son who is obviously Christ. The dragon's going to try to kill the son, but the dragon can't. The son escapes, and the son is the one who rules the nations with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. And then there's this giant war in heaven where the dragon is thrown down. He's thrown out. He can no longer be an accuser of the brethren. And there's this loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before our God day and night. And listen to this part. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. That word of their testimony, it's, it's, it's like a, in, in the original language, the word is like a, a, the word used for martyr. And so they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of their martyr, because of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Facing persecution, and it may be facing death. Lord willing, in our nation, it's not. It's it's facing being hated by your, your next door neighbor. It's being faced, hated by your workers because you won't use their transgender pronouns. <laughs> it's being faced with hatred by your family members because they think you're like a cult leader because you don't send your children off to the public schools. You don't, uh, you don't have a wife who dresses immodestly. They, they're people just are flabbergasted at you. And so you're hated. 
when you love the Lord more than you love yourself, more than you love popularity, more than even your life, that's what overcomes the dragon. That's where the victory comes. And our hope is that by faith in Christ, he will hold us fast and we will overcome. The victory is ours. Let's face it, most of the physical persecution you know, that we've been hearing about, most of us are not going to face that, at least here in the West. Uh, we may face some, you know, I've faced some, Spurgeon's faced some. Uh, I mean, the worst that's ever been happened to me is, like, I've had some cars try and run me over, had a knife pulled on me, I had a gun pulled on me, although I don't think that guy was even serious about using it. It's, it's not an entire village with a rope trying to string you up in the middle of town uh, for passing out Bibles, okay? You know, it, it's most of us are just not going to experience that. But we will experience hardship for our faith. Uh, if you are bold, if you are truthful, if you love people enough and love your Lord enough to share the gospel and to expose error, to expose sin, uh, to be blunt where you need to be blunt and to be compassionate where you need to be compassionate, you're going to get pushback. You're going to get persecution for it. And and for most of us, that's probably going to look like maybe losing some friends, maybe having stressed relationships, maybe your neighbors think you're weird, <laughs> you know, maybe having some family members not want to talk to you for a while or, or not be real close to you. Uh, it, it'll probably look like losing opportunities. Uh, you might lose a job. Um, but I will tell you this from experience uh, every time you go through hardship and persecution because of the gospel, because of the truth, um, it refines you, and it tells you something about yourself and shows you where you need to grow. Um, it shows you where you've grown, and ultimately, when you make it through and you're better for it, it gives glory to God. So keep that in mind when hardship comes, when persecution hits, and whatever form it might take in your life. Uh, keep your eyes on Christ and don't take them off. And remember that he's worthy to be trusted and he's worthy of going through this uh, because it does give him glory, because he does have purpose in it. Uh, there is purpose in our suffering, no matter what it is, no matter if we have an answer on this side of heaven or not. Uh, keep that in mind and practice casting anxiety and worry aside in your everyday life because when persecution hits, uh, that practice will pay off. And that's our episode for this week. If you want to support this show, and we do appreciate it if you do, go to fightlaughfeast.com, click to sign up to become a member, and use the code PATRIARCHY when you do. It supports our show, it gets you access to behind-the-scenes content and extra material. Depending on the level you sign up for, it gets you some extra goodies as well. So go to fightlaughfeast.com, Click to sign up to become a member and use the code PATRIARCHY to support our show. If you'd like to get yourself some Patriarchy merchandise, we have partnered with Confessional Wear to bring that to you. So go to confessionalwear.com, click on their menu, and go to Podcast Collaborations and look for our show there. We have a couple t-shirts and a coffee mug and more on the way. Go to confessionalwear.com, go to Podcast Collaborations, and look for the Patriarchy Podcast. So until next time. If you have not yet bowed your knee to Christ, repent and believe. And if you have, this is our call to you. Build, fight, protect, lead. This is The Patriarchy.